Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1997 release, Wishmaster. Yes, this is a um, serial resin co piece that I got from a Fright Crate. So if you don't know, I do Fright Crate unboxings. And this one is particularly cool. And it reminded me that, you know, taking a look at it, that I should re-watch Wishmaster and actually do a review of it. So it's been a few years since I've actually watched Wishmaster, but Wishmaster... <laughs> But when I first watched it, I remember quite enjoying it and being like, why don't more people actually talk about this film? I mean, it's a Wes Craven executive produced film. A lot of people talk about Wes Craven stuff, except Shocker, which I, I have a review for Shocker on here. That movie. Ooh. So anyway, let's talk about Wishmaster. And one of the most impressive things about this film, in my opinion, is the fact of how many uh, big, well, big slash Big names for people who are into horror are in this film. Um, obviously, it's headed up by Wes Craven, but you have some really awesome names in there, which I'll talk about later. Well, I'll just throw it out now. I mean, they have, like, uh, Greg Nicotero worked on this film. I mean, that's awesome in itself. The narrator for the film was Angus Scrim. I love Angus Scrim. I'm a big Phantasm fan. You had Ted Raimi, Tony Todd, Robert England, Reggie Bannister, Kane Hodder. I mean, it's like... And then the fact that people don't really talk about this film all that much, it, it just boggles my mind because of all the, like, the horror star power that comes together in it. For nothing other than that, I think people should talk about it. But it's a fun film. That's the other thing. I think it's a lot of fun. Is it a perfect film? Is it a great film? No, but it's fun. All right, so it was directed by Robert Kurtzman. So Robert Kurtzman hasn't done a whole lot of directing. Um... He's, he's done a little bit more than Wishmaster, uh, and, and there was a second Wishmaster. I think it's Wishmaster 2 Evil Never Dies, I think is what it was called. But uh, he hasn't done a whole lot directing. He mainly does special effects, practical effects. And so I'm, I'm going to give you a rundown of some of the films he's done practical effects on. It's a little bit of a long list, but I'm, I'm giving you a lot of these names to illustrate to you how many awesome films this guy's been involved with. Uh, Dr. Sleep, The Haunting of Hill House. Gerald's Game, so obviously he's worked with Mike Flanagan a bunch, Yoga Hosers, and Tusk, so he's worked with Kevin Smith. People wouldn't say great films, but It Follows, John Dies at the End, Bubba Hotep, 13 Ghosts, The Faculty, Very Bad Things, Spawn, Scream, Dust From Dust Till Dawn, In the Mouth of Madness, Wes Craven's New Nightmare, Army of Darkness, The People Under the Stairs, Misery, Bride of Reanimator, Nightmare on Elm Street 5, Evil Dead 2, Night of the Creeps, Phantasm 2. And that's just some. Those are those are like the bigger horror names that I kind of picked out. I mean, I know Very Bad Things isn't technically horror, but it got some horrific stuff to it. So kind of horror adjacent. But impressive, Robert Kurtzman. And I thought you did a pretty good job directing Wishmaster. Just saying. So this film is written by Peter Atkins, who also wrote Hellraiser 2, Hellraiser 3, and Hellraiser Bloodline. Those are just the other ones I pulled out from, from his list of things. And Hellraiser 2 is really, really awesome. I think it's a wonderful uh, follow-up to the first Hellraiser. Hellraiser 3 is still solid, and Bloodline I don't think is bad either. Uh, it's after that that you start getting kind of... Uh, executive produced by Wes Craven, like I talked about. Harry Manfredini did the music for this film, which, if people don't know, he did a lot of the music for Friday the 13th, so his stuff is pretty iconic. So that's a kind of a big name as far as music goes. The budget for this film was $5 million, and it actually ended up making $15.7 million. So that's pretty good for back in 1997, to be honest. I mean, they, like, tripled their money. Um, yeah, that's good. Uh, do, do, do. All right, so the actual events of it. The opening portion that shows horrific chaos uh, that the djinn has released uh, in the past does a really good job of showing his level of power, plus it's just like a balls-to-the-wall nuts scene of just like, here's craziness. And the cool thing about that scene is that it basically comes full circle because exactly what goes on in that scene is exactly what goes on at the very end of the film. So it's like foreshadowing how the film is going to end basically you know a in the beginning a a wizard shows up and takes care of it but what is the modern day wizard is tammy lauren's character she is the modern day wizard um 
as a scientist because you know wizardry and science science is the new wizardry and magic in a sense and there are kind of some quotes alluding to that whole thing that i'll talk about a little bit as we go on uh but yeah i really like that that a it starts off like super crazy with that party and things are just going nuts b i love that it ends the same way because it's just such a fun way to end the film and i just like that it it does that kind of full circle thing. It's super cool. Uh, so <laughs> this is like, don't drink on the jobs, folks, because you could end up unleashing an evil gin upon the world. Uh, <laughs> I just thought it was funny that, like, they, they show you this guy just, like, pouring booze into his coffee. And then it's just like, oh, man, I dropped it. It's all broken. But it's not all that dude's fault, obviously, because then someone found the jewel and they try to sell it. So, you know. Not to say that a lot of people wouldn't do that, but, yeah. Not drink on the job, but if they found the jewel, try to sell it. Uh, that dude just won't stop trying to get a date. <laughs> it makes makes you okay with him getting it first. The Her buddy, the the guy who's like, I'm no gemologist, who she goes to to, like, analyze the gem. Um, I forget what his name is, but he was just crazy persistent with, like, want to have a date, want to have a date, and she's like, no, no, no. So I guess in the end, because after she puts everything back to being right, she goes to him and is just like, what are we doing for a date tonight? And he's like, oh, okay. I guess she did like him uh, from the get-go, but was just kind of a, like afraid of losing him as a friend. Like she says that, but you kind of don't know in the beginning if she's just saying that in the sense of, I just want to get him off my back. I have no interest in dating him because, you know, people, people say things for that reason, but also... You could see it the other way where it's just like, I'm afraid that I won't have any interaction with him. I do like him and would like to date him, but I'm afraid that things go wrong and then I have no ties to him. So I'd rather have just friendship as opposed to nothing at all. And that's kind of what it seems at the very end. In the beginning, it just seemed like, get off my case, get away from me. But at the end, it seems more like, oh, well, I actually did like him. And now that I spent some time with him being dead, <laughs> I appreciate uh, that I should go for it with this guy. So... I, I thought that was an interesting kind of full circle on that as well. The djinn just talks like he's evil, basically. And, and it just makes me think it's funny that people, like, want to interact with him with the way that he talks. He just talks like an evil dude, even when he's a human, and that's just creepy. So a lot of these people, the fact that they're just like, oh, hey, oh, how's it going? And just having a conversation is a little, like, unrealistic because people just be like, uh, get away from me, weirdo. Uh, the Jin's stages of existence and transformation look pretty awesome. Uh, when he first shows up, I mean, just the overall makeup of the Jin itself looks really good, which is very similar to this. This is a really good resin piece. Um, it just looks good. But what, here's the thing. Like, what what is it with these, what's the deal with these tentacle things? Not on this, but in the movie. Like, what's the deal with it? Because they, like, move a little bit, too. And it's just like, do gins have tentacles? Like, head tentacles? It's a really weird design idea. And I was just like, mm, I don't really get it. But it doesn't seem to serve any purpose. But whatever, you know. But I like the design of the gin. But I really like the design of when he comes out of the, the uh, gem initially. And he's kind of, like, in this, like, stripped-down phase. It's almost like a la Hellraiser to be honest, where, you know, they're without skin. And there are actually a bunch of moments of, like, people flayed or people without their faces, which is a big kind of callback to Hellraiser, in my opinion. So, yeah, I just like the look of that. Did anyone notice the Pazuzu statue in Raymond Beaumont's house slash museum? Did you? Did you? He, it was in the background when, when the, I think it was when the, the girl first goes over there, when Tammy Lauren's character first goes over there. And they're walking through, like, you see them walk past it, it's in the background. So, cool reference to The Exorcist. I like that. Uh, I like how the djinn suggests wishes. It's, a, it's actually kind of a funny thing. It isn't one of those those situations where, you know, because this is a very old story uh, about, you know, a genie in a bottle. It's just a evil horror twist on it. And in the, like, the original versions of the story, people have to make the wishes themselves. But I like how in this version, he, like, suggests it. He's like, oh, wouldn't you like this? Or wouldn't you like this? And they're just like, yeah. And he's like, there you go. And and it's not going to be what you thought it was. I just like that little twist to it. 
There are a few crappy kills in this one that don't hold up, in my opinion, just because they seem kind of lazy. The one being the girl being turned into the mannequin, I think that's just dumb. Uh, the one with Kane Hodder as the uh, security guard getting put into the glass door and then he walks through him. I mean, with that one, it would have been a little bit better if he like walked into the glass and it shattered then, or he just blew up the glass as opposed to he walks through it and it like warps and then it explodes after the fact. So I just thought it was pretty dumb. And then also the, the death for Tony Todd's character as the bouncer, the fact that he was just like, in a container of water in a straight jacket. Like, it's dumb. It's lazy. It's stupid. But there are some other good kills in this. And the practical effects in general look awesome. And that's one of the best things about this film. And that keeps me coming back to it. Well, I mean, I, I haven't watched it a ton. But I've watched it a few times. But that's what I like about the film. And, and what makes me interested in, in watching it more is it looks really good practical effects wise. I really appreciate good practical effects. So... But it just bothers me when there were some of these kills that were just, like, super lazy and dumb, in my opinion. I like the point they make that in a world that doesn't believe in magic, something that is magic reigns. That's kind of what uh, the djinn tells her when when the djinn has um, the, old, the older woman's face on when he's masquerading as her. Uh, and he's just like, oh, you know, there's no way that this thing can be stopped because there's no such thing as magic in this world. But... Like I was saying, in the end, science, she is a scientist, science is the new magic in a way, is what they're kind of saying. But in the end, she just kind of beats him with logic, I guess, by making a very careful wish. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The gin blowing his brains out was actually a pretty funny moment where she's just like, I'd like you to blow your brains out. And he's just like, okay. And then he just sprouts another brain in the top of his head and he's just like, you know, if it's any consolation, that really hurt. <laughs> I thought that was funny. That was some pretty good writing. Uh, enjoyed that. I like the the dog thing that's inside of the gym when she gets transported in there, uh, when Tammy Lauren's character gets transported in there. I really like that dog thing. The design of it was really cool. It looked really good. What I did, didn't particularly like are, like, the walls of the gym. It looks really hokey and, like, low budget and crappy, and it kind of reminds me of Killer Clowns from Outer Space, the inside of their their big top circus ship just saying uh the party scene is awesome yeah and like i was saying that's where it comes full circle because you have that crazy party scene in the beginning and it's just it feels like a really cool payoff at the end when everything's just going nuts at the party and you start to get i mean i do i don't know about you you all out there but you start to get kind of excited when the conversation that the gin's having with beaumont goes to oh i through this amazing party and he's just like oh man i i wish i could have a party like that something to that effect and you're just like oh oh you're like oh please fingers crossed and then it happens and you're just like this is an awesome payoff this is great because then you see a lot more of that awesome practical effects and it feels like they just throw everything including the kitchen sink at that scene and it's just fun like it's fun and it's a great payoff like i said love it the djinn makes some very annoying noises at the end of his sentences. Like, he keeps doing things that will just be like, I'm the djinn. There's a whole lot of that <laughs> that goes on. That in the beginning, I was okay with it, but it keeps going throughout the film. And it gets very, very, very annoying. That's probably my biggest gripe with this film in general. Along with the, the lazy, crappy kills. Is you just kept going like... At the end of sentences, and it's like, stop. It's annoying. Stop. Who thought to do that? I wonder if it was the actor, if that was his idea, or if it was directed that way. Uh, there's a really awesome quote in here that I wrote down because I wanted to make sure I threw this out there. I don't need you dead. I just need you to wish you were. That is a great piece of dialogue that was uh, written in the script. Well, I assume it was written in the script and not ad-libbed, but that's when the djinn says it to Tammy. He's trying to get her to make the third wish. He's just like, I don't need you dead. I just need you to wish you were. I was like, oh, that's so good. Love it. Uh, so wishing the guy wasn't drinking on the job in the end, that's how she beats him, uh, wasn't... I, I feel like this is kind of a plot hole because 
it's presented as in, oh, she's so smart because she thought, let's take it back to before anything even became a problem, before the, the gem was exposed, so the guy shouldn't have been drunk, drinking on the job. Well, with other wishes, there are a lot of ways that the djinn got around it and made it terrible, so he easily could have done it on this one. So that's why I say this is kind of a plot hole, because if she was just like, oh, he, I, I don't want him to have been drinking on the job. He could be like, okay, well, then he was doing drugs and the same thing happened. Okay, he fell asleep because he didn't have a good night of sleep the night before. He fell asleep and the same thing happened. Like, there are so many options to for him to alter it so that the same thing ends up happening. And he has that power, obviously. So, plot hole, it, it kind of dumb, in a sense. Uh, the movie feel so I'm done with like the actual events of the film. I'm going to talk about it in general. The movie feels like it's consistently moving at a good pace. That is one of the other things I really like about this. It doesn't feel like it drags at any point, and I greatly appreciate that about any film, really, when they pull that off. The awesome practical effects and, and the anticipation of how the wishes will go wrong are basically what keep you engaged in watching you... I don't know, you just kind of have this feeling that while the djinn's on the loose, that anyone he encounters could be a potential victim. And you just don't know how many of those people there will be. And that's what keeps your interest. You keep being like, all right, what's next? What's next? And I like that about it. Andrew Divoff, uh, he was the guy who played the djinn. I think he did a good job. He did a really good job when he was in his human form with... His facial expressions, he looked very menacing. Obviously, he did a good job with his voice, minus the whole, like, thing at the end of sentences. Uh, and just to let you know, he was in The Hunt for Red October and Air Force One, which were, you know, two of the more high-profile films that he's been in before. So if he looked familiar, you might know him from those films. I don't know. Uh, so this is a modern twist on a very old story that highlights the issues of human greed. It's, like I said before, it's a very old story. It's just changed and modernized and made more gory and evil which i'm all for that i love when horror the horror genre does that they take these old stories and they just kind of like bring them up to date and make them very evil and horror related love it and the wishes end up being tied to very base human emotions and things come out terribly it kind of makes the point of logic over emotions will keep you safe and it's an intelligent and well thought out wish that finishes things in the end. So basically, it, it, it seems to kind of make the point that when people are doing these wishes, what's putting them in danger and making things happen awful, happen horribly, is when they're going off of base emotion. Like, I want this, I want that, it's all about me, and it's base emotion related. Which ties into life. If you just go through your entire life... Uh, going off your base emotions and I want, I want, I want, you're going to end up in some hor horrible situations, much like in this film. You know, loosely. Uh, but in the end, what wins out and what makes sure, makes sure everything is good and ru is running smoothly again are well-thought-out logical choices slash wishes. So that's kind of saying in real life, it, when you stop and you think logically about something you make better choices and you're going to have a better life. So that's just kind of my thought on the overall theme of the film. Um, it's not anything kind of like groundbreaking, especially given that, you know, it's an old story that kind of tells that story anyway. So whatever. But uh, I enjoy Wishmaster and I actually haven't seen the second Wishmaster movie, but I've been meaning to get to it. And now that I just rewatched Wish Wishmaster, feel like I want to bump that second one up my list more. So put down a comment. Let me know. First of all, let me know your thoughts on Wishmaster if you've seen it. Second of all, uh, tell me if you really think that I need to get to Wishmaster too soon. And if I do, do you want a review on it? Because I could or could not. I don't know. It's up. It's kind of up to you guys. Do you really want a Wishmaster too? Well, I mean, ultimately, it's up to me. But I want to hear from you guys. Give me some input. So put down a comment, but do me a quick favor. If you like any videos I do, this or any other ones, uh, please hit that subscribe. That's your way to repay me. Um, and also, if you've already subscribed, go ahead and hit that thumbs up for me. And if you want to subscribe and hit the thumbs up, that's cool as well. But the subscribe's the big thing. Thanks, everyone, for checking this out, though. And until next time, keep it brutal.